A man with a bristling grey beard came and sat next to me at lunch. He had very pale blue eyes and an aggressive way of speaking. What do you do, he said at once, and without any preliminary introduction, when your boat hits a force ten gale in the channel, what do you do with your female crew? I don't know, I said, suspecting some kind of joke. What do you do with your female crew? But he answered seriously. Double your fist, hit her on the head and stun her. That way she's far less likely to be swept overboard. But isn't it very dangerous, your sport of yachting? Not dangerous at all, provided you don't learn to swim. I made up my mind when I bought my first boat never to learn to swim. Why was that? When you're in a spot of trouble, if you can swim, you try to strike out for the shore. You invariably drown. As I can't swim, I cling to the wreckage. And they send a helicopter out for me. That's my tip. If you ever find yourself in trouble, cling to the wreckage. It was advice that I thought I'd been taking for most of my life. My father was a very clean man who never took less than two baths a day. One day I came home from school and found him wearing a white toweling dressing gown and sitting on the closed lavatory seat in the bathroom. My mother was squeezing out his toothpaste. She found his hand and put the toothbrush into it. Then she guided his hand towards his mouth. That was the first time I saw that he was totally blind. Although I now feel I knew him so well, he was remote to me then, a hard-working barrister with a flourishing practice in the probate, divorce and admiralty division. Often he would tell me of his triumphs in court, and I must have been very young when he said, Remarkable win today, old boy. Only evidence of adultery we had was a pair of footprints upside down on the dashboard of an Austin 7 parked in Hampstead Garden suburb. Busily engaged on his legal practice, my father seemed, no doubt understandably, anxious to postpone his complete introduction to me, his only child. It's true that I saw him occasionally when he got me to rub his tobacco and pretend it was Indian pemmican, a game which had an element of mystery as I had no idea what pemmican might be, but in those early days he was a remote figure. His clerk came to drive him to the law courts each morning, tucking a rug round his legs and removing him in a large, hearse-like Morris Oxford. My father's clerk was called Leonard, which was not his name. It's true that my father had once had a clerk called Leonard, who tragically had been killed on the Somme, after which my father called all his clerks Leonard although the one I remember who was to be his clerk for many years was undoubtedly a secret William. Those years seemed populated by governesses and filled with the smell of maids' bedrooms, a curious, pungent odour, compounded, I suppose, of sweat and face powder and Woolworth's perfume, the smell of my childhood, which I haven't encountered for half a century. The maids were invariably kind and seemed, to my short-sighted eyes, beautiful. One, I remember, received me in her bedroom and chatted to me as she squatted on a large rose-patterned chamber pot. Another made me a Highland costume out of kitchen paper. When the time came to begin my formal education, a governess escorted me each morning to school on the underground. In my fantasies, I always hoped that she would kidnap me and take me home to her husband, whom I imagined to be a burglar living in Shepherd's Bush which I had somehow heard of as a place of ill repute. My mother's family came from Leamington Spa. I have a photograph of my grandfather fishing, surrounded by his three daughters and formidable wife. He's wearing a sort of cricketing cap, a starched collar and a tweed jacket. He was a taboo subject and no one ever said much about him except that he was called Mr Smith and his profession was, as my father said with the sole purpose of irritating my mother, a bum bailiff, or Warwickshire debt collector. I have no idea why he shot himself, but my mother, at the end of her life, told me that it happened while she had a job as a schoolmistress in South Africa. She learned of it because her family sent her out a copy of the local paper with the announcement of her father's death carefully marked as a news item which might possibly interest her. From what she told me, I understand they sent no covering letter. 
My mother had studied art in Birmingham, to which city she bicycled daily. Later, she taught drawing in Manchester, at a lycée in Versailles, and at a girls' school in Natal, where she rode bareback across the veldt and swam naked under the waterfalls. She was a new woman, who read Bernard Shaw and Catherine Mansfield, whom she resembled a little in looks. My grandmother was a high church Anglican, whose bedside table supported a prayer book and a crucifix, but my mother had no use at all for God, although she was to become revered as a heroine and a saint in her middle age. She earned these titles, of course, for putting up with my father, an almost impossible task. When, after his blindness, my father insisted on continuing with his legal practice as though nothing had happened, my mother it was who read his briefs to him and who made notes of all his cases. She became a well-known figure in the law courts, as well-known as the tipstaff or the Lord Chief Justice, leading my father from court to court, smiling patiently as he tapped the paved floors with his clouded malacca cane, and shouted abuse either at her or at his instructing solicitor, or at both of them at the same time. From early in the war, when they settled permanently in the country, my mother drove my father to Henley Station and took him up in the train. Ensconced in a corner seat, dressed like Winston Churchill in a black jacket and striped trousers, bow tie worn with a wing collar, boots and spats, my father would require her to read in a loud and clear voice the evidence in the divorce cases that would be his day's work. As the train ground to a halt around Maidenhead, the first-class carriage would fall silent as my mother read out the reports of private investigators on adulterous behaviour which they had observed in detail. If she dropped her voice over descriptions of stained bed linen, male and female clothing found scattered about, or misconduct in motor cars, my father would call out, Speak up, Kath! And their fellow travellers would be treated to another thrilling instalment. My father's family had been West Country farmers, but his father was a Bristol brewer who in a moment of Wesleyan zeal became a teetotaler and signed the pledge. After that, my grandfather only drank a temperance beverage of his own preparing, which produced in him, my father noticed, many of the outward and visible signs of advanced intoxication. Forbidden by his conscience to carry on brewing, my Methodist grandfather emigrated to South Africa when my father was four years old and started up in the less convivial trade of an estate agent. So my father grew up in Natal at the end of the 19th century. As a child, he helped unfasten the horses and draw the carriage of the general who relieved Ladysmith. And he was forever sickened by the sight of a Negro prisoner being taken into captivity, handcuffed to the stirrup of a white policeman's cantering horse. He went to a South African version of an English public school. But in the holidays, his parents often sent him up country to some small and lonely hotel so that he could run wild. He told me that when he was a boy, he was given a birthday cake in a tin and kept it under his hotel bed. When his birthday came, he took it out and ate it in solitary celebration. Both his and my mother's family, it seems, were determined to avoid any situation in which they could sniff the danger of an emotional display. I have a mental picture of my father in a Norfolk jacket and knickerbockers lying on the baked earth among the yellowing grass, reading the Colin Doyle stories in the Strand magazine sent out from England, lost in the mists of Baker Street. The other author he greatly admired was Ryder Haggard, who wrote The Myths of the Englishman's Africa, stories of Umschlopagars and Alan Quatermain, and the monocled Captain Good and the deathless queen, She Who Must Be Obeyed. My father and I grew to know each other when I was about ten, and he had gone to Switzerland for a series of painful and hopeless eye operations. We would go for walks together in the summer, and he'd tell me the Sherlock Holmes stories of which he had almost total recall. On other walks, he would make my flesh creep with the account of Huck Finn and the Negro Jim on their raft on the swollen Mississippi, where an entire displaced house floated past them, containing a man who'd been shot dead at cards. When my father told me the adventures of Jeeves and Bertie Wooster, he'd stand on the mountain path, dabbing at his streaming eyes and almost choking with laughter. 
I enjoyed these stories so much it was my ambition to become a butler when I grew up. At some time, great stretches of Shakespeare's plays had lodged in my father's head, and he used the lines for odd moments of pleasure, intoning, Nymph in thy orisons be all my sins remembered, when standing in the law court's lavatory or during breakfast. When I was young, he often greeted me with, Is execution done on Cordor? A question which, at the age of six, I was at a loss to answer. When he was 17, my father came back from South Africa to go to Cambridge, where he read law and made few friends. He won a scholarship in his bar exams and went into the army when the war started. My mother, who had met the Mortimer family in South Africa, wrote to him when she came back to England. He bought a cold chicken and took her on the river at Chiswick, where he proposed to her at once. He was then a subaltern about to go to France, where the expectation of life was not much more than a month. However, some sympathetic senior officer, taking account of my father's short sight and recent marriage, got him a job in the inland waterways. It was fortunately a post with no heroic temptations. Years later, when I felt my life expectancy to be similarly abbreviated, he said, You know what, old boy? If they give us war again, get yourself a job in the inland waterways. Heroism of any kind was something my father did his best to avoid. And his courage in carrying on his legal practice when he was blind came from a determination to avoid the issue and pretend he could still see perfectly well. If my mother advanced an opinion, which she did rarely, she meant what she said, a form of speech which my father found merely boring. He was a natural advocate and what he said was rarely called on to express his personal feelings or beliefs. His words were like challenges, thrown out into the darkness in the hope that they would start a tournament, or like clay pigeons shot up into the sky for anyone to pot at. Love has been greatly overestimated by the poets, he would say, or no one could possibly get the slightest pleasure out of music, or 90% of all illness is caused by doctors, or, to me, going away to school, try not to mix too closely with the schoolmasters. All schoolmasters have second-rate minds. A simple way to irritate him, as my mother got to know perfectly well, was not to argue with him. He had what he would call in the charges made in other people's divorce petitions a violent and ungovernable temper, although I can't remember it getting any worse when he lost his sight. He would shout on railway platforms, in restaurants, in the corridors of the law courts, where he once yelled Macbeth's curse, The devil damn thee, black, thou cream-faced loon, at an instructing solicitor who'd forgotten to file an affidavit. Cold plates, soft-boiled eggs, being kept waiting for anything, such irritations, rather than the disaster of blindness, would make him thunder at my mother, Cath, Cath! Are you a complete cretin? Only sometimes, after long periods of abuse borne patiently, she would walk away from him, and my father would be left standing in the middle of the bedroom, a silver-backed hairbrush in his hand and his braces dangling, panic-stricken, and yelling, Calf! Calf! into the unresponsive darkness around him. such a slope-shouldered, belly-protuberant, stooping and deformed appearance. Answer me that, O oh ye faithless and hunchback generation. The headmaster of my prep school looked very much like God. 
He had long, white, slightly curly hair and was old and beautiful. He wore a dark suit which had shortish trousers showing the tops of his highly polished black boots. He also spoke in God's prose, a mixture of the Old Testament and Rudyard Kipling's Just So stories. Draw nigh and hearken to me, O litter of runts and weaklings. I say unto you that you are round-shouldered through the wearing of braces. Unbutton your braces and cast them from you. Each boy to acquire a dark blue elastic belt with snake buckle to be slotted neatly into the loops provided at the top of school shorts. Dear Mummy, I wrote in the compulsory letter home, I don't like it here at all. I know it said braces on the clothes list, but we're not allowed braces any more. In fact, we have to cast them from us. Noah told us this in assembly. We were expected to call the staff by their nicknames. The headmaster's was Noah. Could you send me a dark blue belt with a snake buckle as quickly as you can? What? Gasping for breath, ye red-faced and pop-eyed generation. Noah looked us with amused contempt at the following week's assembly. Why do you show such clear signs of stomach contraction? Why are you an offence to the eye, all tied up like parcels? I say unto you, there will be no more belts or the wearing thereof. Abandon belts, each boy to equip himself with a decent pair of sturdy, elastic braces. Dear Mummy, I read, I still don't like it here. Would you please send me a new pair of braces as soon as you can? I, I cast mine aside, and now I can't find them. And now I have to cast aside my belt. I had a recurring dream, which was at the age of nine I should be taken out and hanged. In my dream, I protested to my father at this gloomy destiny, but he seemed not to hear. When I spoke to my mother, she gave me her usual large-eyed, reasonable smile and told me that it was something that happened to all small boys and it was really nothing to worry about. I now feel sure that what I was looking forward to as the morning of my execution was my being sent away to school. At no time did my mother ever explain satisfactorily why she was determined to get me out of the house for the best part of the year, to send me off to face the gloom and discomfort of icy dormitories, terrible fish, which wore a sort of black mackintosh and was eaten with tin peas, and shell-shocked masters who either confused us with the Huns or fell embarrassingly in love with us. Loneliness, however, the birthright of the only child, held no particular terrors for me. In the holidays, having built his new house near to our old country cottage, my father devoted almost all his spare time to a large garden. And as his eyes failed and the flowers and vegetables faded from his view, his gardening became more dedicated. Until when he could no longer see the results of his labours, but had to rely on my mother or me to describe the health of a dahlia or the wilt of a clematis, he spent every possible hour pricking out or potting on or groping for dead heads and trying to get a correct aim with his secateurs. He never welcomed visitors and would often ask my mother to lead him away into the undergrowth if they appeared at the gate. So a month or two would pass without us seeing anyone at all. My segregated education seemed to have driven some sort of wedge between me and Iris Jones, the gardener's daughter from the cottage along the common. She was exactly my age, and I would steal necklaces for her from Woolworths. All one summer we made houses on the common, enjoying the sharp, musky smell of the bracken, furnishing our homes with chipped coronation mugs and bottomless, rusty saucepans, which we found in the local tip. One day, Iris offered to show me her knickers. I took off my glasses not knowing exactly what to expect. Being alone was easier, I had long ago discovered, if you became two people, the actor and the observer. The observer was always the same. The actor played many parts. An officer in the Foreign Legion, for instance, or a ruthless private detective with rooms in Half Moon Street, or a brigadier in Napoleon's army. There he goes, I was able to say about myself, even in the deeply unhappy days 
when I lolloped about a frozen football field, keeping as far as possible from the ball. Cantering across the burning sands with his crack platoon of Spahis, in search of the tents of Mahmud Bay and a levelling of the score after the disgrace of Sidi Ben Oud. Later, my character became more sophisticated, as I came more under the influence of Noel Coward and Dornford Yates. Sic vos non vobis merificates apes. Translate, Mortimer. Thus you don't make honey for yourselves, you apes, sir. Mortimer drew a flat gold cigarette case from the breast pocket of his immaculate grey double-breasted jacket. He was bubbling with suppressed laughter. The answer had been deliberately misleading. With a tap, the heavy case sprang open, and he offered it to the bewildered little man at the blackboard. Turkish this side, he said, and Virginian the other. Later still, when I made a friend... We inflicted our lies on each other. Childhood's a great time for lying. Later in life you may be able to boast of some real achievement or some extraordinary adventure. In childhood all must be supplied from the imagination. So I told my friend that I was the son of a Russian aristocrat, smuggled out of Moscow during the revolution, and had been kindly taken in by the simple English lawyer with whom I happened to live. I had a long story, a, a rare sporting fantasy, about walking along the towpath at Hammersmith when the cocks of the Oxford crew had a heart attack and being then of the appropriate weight, steering the eight to victory in the boat race. More consistently, I pretended that my parents never stopped going to cocktail parties, bickering, throwing white ladies and Manhattans into each other's faces and would soon be getting a divorce. If I had one clear ambition during those years, it was to be the child of a broken home. At first, we merely talked about the plays we had seen. My father went to the theatre regularly, usually after consuming a leisurely four-course dinner at the Trocadero, which would mean his being led into the entertainment, followed by me in a state of acute embarrassment and an Eton suit, somewhere about the middle of the first act. We always occupied seats in the front row of the stores, so our arrival never passed unnoticed, either from the stage or the audience. Failing vision and a late start made the plots of new plays extremely hard for my father to follow, and the show would be punctuated by deafening whispers of, What's happening now, Kath? Go on, paint me the picture. With Shakespeare, of course, he had no problem, and could remember all the quotations and say lines aloud and with great relish seconds before the actors. Once a year, we go to Stratford and see all the productions. We stayed in a hotel in which the bedrooms were called after plays and decorated with ancient engravings of blood-curdling scenes from the major tragedies. One night, I was frozen with fear at a curiously ghoulish engraving of the witches in Macbeth. I turned my eyes from the picture to the wardrobe mirror, only to be stricken to a more permanent immobility by the sight of a frightful phantom product, no doubt, of the witch's cauldron, consisting only of two pale, spindly legs and a white-hooded blur. I'd been standing for a long while before I realised that I was looking at the reflection of myself, taking off my shirt. After long theatrical discussions, during which we drew out the seating plans for most of the London theatres, we decided to put on plays at my home during weekend visits. This excitingly entailed writing off for reviews, sketches and printed paper scenery from Samuel French Limited, but there were several dangers in inviting my friend home. He would inevitably be exposed to certain disgraceful facts about my family, which I had been at pains to conceal, such as the immovable solidity of my parents' marriage, the glaring absence of a cocktail shaker, and my father's growing blindness. These things must have been obvious to my friend, but he was too polite to mention any of them. However, I noticed him staring at my mother's fingernails, which I had described to him as very long and painted green, and taking in the fact that they were rather blunt and chipped from a good deal of potting up. We put on a review, which we had written, called Champagne Cocktail, and one we bought from Samuel French called Airy Nothings. We stood on the dining room stairs in bedspreads and pink paper shakos and sang selections from Ivan Novello. 
We did a play I wrote where we acted the ghosts of two young subalterns killed on the Somme. Whenever she heard that we were going to do what my father called an entertainment, my mother would give a little cry of horror at the thought of all the clearing up. When we played the two ghostly officers, we laughed so much we felt compelled to run into the kitchen to eat cold roast potatoes smeared with honey, a dish we thought would be disgusting enough to bring us to our senses. Back at school, the theatrical productions were better regulated and, and very well done. Each year we did a Shakespeare play and a Gilbert and Sullivan opera, and by a process of extreme democracy of which the left wing of equity would approve, the plays were cast by popular vote. In our last year, I won Richard II. By that time, the school had become for me a place of glorious excitement. I lay awake at night, repeating, For God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, and I hardly slept. Through all this excitement, Noah moved in a mysterious way. He had to deal with a major problem. A boy called Ramsden, who never said much in class, put a tin chamber pot on his head and, and no one could get it off. To avoid public derision, Ramsden was moved from the dormitory to the sanatorium. The doctor was sent for and the school carpenter, but no solution was found. In order to subdue public disquiet, Noah would issue a bulletin at almost every meal about the progress of the crisis. Ramsden may think he has done something extremely clever, Noah boomed sadly. He may think he has drawn attention to himself in some unusual and original manner. Oh, ye of little judgment, would ye laugh at Ramsden? What he has done is just very silly and dangerous. He is missing lessons, which will put him well behind for the school cert. He is causing the unhappy couple who gave birth to him needless anxiety. So I say unto you, go about your daily business, work hard and do your best in the classroom and at school sports. Do not pay Ramsden the compliment of whispering about him in corridors. His exploits are best forgotten. In fact, Ramsden, when we peered at him through a crack in the sanatorium door, presented an unforgettable spectacle. He was sitting bolt upright in bed, wearing striped flannel pyjamas, his ears flattened by a huge chamber pot of chipped enamel, his face decorated by a grin that was at once sheepish and proud. At a subsequent meal, Noah reassured us. A man has been sent for, he announced, expert in these matters. It is to be hoped that in due course Ramsden will be released. Every boy to remember this is no subject for laughter. That afternoon, a man in dungarees with a bag of tools drove up in a van, and later on, an uncrowned Ramsden rejoined the class and resumed his habitual low profile. Harold's house was furnished with his expensive 30s artefacts. White walls, a lot of blue and plum coloured glass, chromium and mahogany. Bulrushes stood about in tall glass jars and Lalique swans held the chocolates on the polished dinner table. The house, always referred to by my father as the North Pole, was not overheated and my aunt had a sort of tweed overcoat made to match her dress for indoor wear. My Uncle Harold was a meticulous man and appreciated conformity. At one breakfast he measured his rasher of bacon with his slide rule and sent it back to the kitchen when he found it too long. John's going to Harrow next term, my mother told them with considerable amusement. He'll have to have a tailed coat there and a boater. And a silver-topped cane, I thought, for going to Lord's. 
I would use it privately to dance like Fred Astaire. They do roast the fags at Harrow, I suppose, my father asked innocently. Know what I'm paying all that money out for unless you get roasted occasionally. A great deal of money, said my uncle. I must say you don't do things by halves, Clifford. He had been pained by my father's extravagance ever since he heard about a barrel of oysters his clerk had been sent out to buy in Fleet Street. I do like a lovely bloater. My father put down his knife and fork and sang very loudly. And so do my mater and pater. Whatever made you choose Harrow? My Aunt Daisy interrupted him to ask. When it had vaguely occurred to my father that the time had come for me to go on to a public school, Noah had immediately said Harrow, a choice for which he gave no sort of explanation. Which of the old boys of that school, I wonder, did he think I might grow up to resemble? Lord Byron, Cardinal Manning, Winston Churchill, or the Mayfair playboys who had recently been flogged in prison after a robbery with violence? My father had, in fact, no more chosen Harrow for me than he'd chosen to spend Christmas with his superstitious brother-in-law or to suffer from glaucoma. These things happened in the mysterious course of evolution and at the wayward direction of the life force, and that was that. Darwin could probably explain it all. When wife is on a diet, I daren't mention fry it. Wifey would only be mad. My father sang whilst the others peeled their peaches and tried to pretend that he wasn't happening. I can't say I found Harrow brutal or, or my time particularly unhappy, but life there never approached the Elizabethan splendours and miseries of my prep school. Harrow's great advantage was that we had rooms of our own, although in the first year we had to share with one other boy, and these did provide a sort of oasis of privacy. Each room had a coal fire and a wooden bed which let down from the wall on which various political slogans were burnt in poker work, such as Death to the Boers and uh, No Home Rule for Ireland. My closest friend was Oliver, known to his many enemies as Oily Pensotti, who had about him the vaguely seductive aura of holidays in Bandol and bedrooms in Mayfair. He wore scuffed suede shoes and used dead white face powder to cover his spots. He used to accompany Radio Luxembourg with the soft musical scrape of a pair of wire brushes played on the top of a suitcase. He came into my life and indeed left it shrouded in an aura of mystery. If I asked him any questions about himself, he would look vaguely amused and avoid giving anything away. Where do you live, Pensotti? Where do I live? Ah, that's what I'm always asking myself. Would you like to help me with a few suggestions? Or what does your father do, Pensotti? What does he do? You mean, what does he do exactly? A lot of people have wanted to know the answer to that, especially my ma. On the fringe of our group, yelling abuse at us, or occasionally kicking his way into our midst, was Tainton, with whom I shared a room. Tainton was a phenomenon. I have never since met anyone in the least like Tainton. I had always hoped that his kind died out with cockfights and bear-baiting. The first thing to be said about Tainton was that he was extremely small. However, he was as tough and leathery as a jockey. He boasted that his mother had given birth to him on the hunting field, after which minor intrusion into a day's sport she went on to the kill at Thorn Wood, according to Tainton. But then Tainton was, on many matters, a most unreliable witness. His habitual expression was a discontented scowl, after which his face would become bright red and suffused with anger. He had yellow curls which stood up on end and ears like jug handles. On certain very rare occasions he smiled and his smile had a sort of shy innocence and even charm. At all times and in all places, Tainton was a source of continual trouble. Before a breathless audience, he tried to cross the lake by swinging from a sort of trapeze made up from his bed linen 
and fell in. He broke windows, he used unspeakable language for the matron, he set fire to the morning post as Keswick was reading it, he put stray cats into people's beds, and at home and during the course of a hunt ball, he shut a Shetland pony into the lady's lavatory, having first dosed it with castor oil. Tenton was apparently born without a sense of fear, and was quite impervious to the consequences of his outrages. I have not read, in my wildest divorce cases, of marriages as violent as my cohabitation with Tenton. As soon as I entered the room, a flung chair splintered against the wall. Tainton was in an evil mood and crouched for a spring. His rages were terrible, totally unpredictable, and extremely destructive. He would tear up my Van Gogh reproductions, spit in my Virginia Woolf, and once he poured a bottle of green ink over the manuscript of my Aldous Huxley-type novella. At night he would groan, have nightmares, subconsciously reenact his birth in the hunting field, or tireless and in a solitary fashion prepare himself for the rigours of married life. At rare moments he would show unexpected charm when he leafed through his large collection of photographs of San Geheni, or cultivated mustard and crest on the silken surface of his top hat. My life with Tenton might be described as days of anxiety and nights of fear. I had absolutely no idea what was going to happen next. We used to be settled down for the night by George the butler, who entered our room in a tailcoat, said, Good night, Thor, seized the poker, raked out the fire, and departed, switching off the light in one fluent gesture. One evening, Tainton hit on the expedient of heating the poker's handle until it was just not red hot, and put it ready for George to seize and burn off several fingers. Spot on cue, George entered, said, Good night, Saul, and astounded us by seizing Tainton's striped Sunday trousers as a poker holder, thus burning a large and smouldering hole in the seat. He left us in the darkness, and Tainton lay awake until the small hours, grinding his teeth and swearing a hideous revenge. I don't know how the invitation to join the Communist Party came, I know that Esmond Romilly is supposed to have started a network of public school cells, but I can't imagine who could have recommended me as a likely candidate. When I joined, I, I formed, so far as I could see, a one-boy communist cell in a sea of Herovian capitalist enterprise. For a while, I received puzzling and contradictory instructions from the party headquarters in King Street. When the Stalin-Hitler Pact was signed, the Russians lost their enthusiasm for the coming struggle, and I was urged to go down to the factory floor and persuade the workers to go slow. I couldn't, I thought, do much about it except put the word round the classroom that Virgil should be translated as lethargically as possible. A go slow which needed no particular encouragement. Later, when Hitler attacked Russia, we were urged to go down on the factory floor and step up production. Again, all I could suggest was the stepping up of the translation of Virgil. After these contradictory commands from King Street, I stopped taking the party's literature and told my friends that the only political views worth having were those of Prince Peter Kropotkin, who believed in anarchism, mutual aid, and the essential goodness of human nature opinions which weren't easy to hold when you were sharing a room with Tainton. In the flight from Tainton, I spent more and more time alone in the high marmorial Victorian library. I found Lord Byron's Turkish slippers in a glass case and set myself to follow his uneasy pilgrimage round the school. From the tomb of John Peachy, where he lay to write poetry, to the grave where his daughter is buried outside Harrow Church to teach her a sharp lesson for being illegitimate. Then, as now, I found Lord Byron deeply sympathetic. His potent mixture of revolutionary fervour and crusty conservatism, his life of a Puritan voluptuary, of a romantic with common sense, was intoxicating to me. I spent afternoons in the library drinking imaginary hock and seltzer swimming the Hellespont, or limping round Newstead Abbey with a harem of housemaids. 
I stayed up late gambling with Dallas and awoke to find the chamber pot overflowing with banknotes. And then I read of Byron's Harrow friendships, especially that with Lord Clare. Years after he left school, Byron met Clare by chance on the road to Bologna and was deeply moved, feeling apparently his heart beat at his fingers' ends. I tried to imagine a chance encounter with Tainton on Western Avenue in twenty years' time and decided that my fingers' ends would remain unexcited. Life in the intervening years for Lord Byron had not perhaps been all that it was cracked up to be. When war was declared, when we waited in that far-off and hazy autumn for the first attack, Oliver Pensotti and I spent a good deal of our time wondering if we'd be slaughtered before we had actually been to bed with any sort of lady. This understandable concern was combined, in Oliver's case, with a deep anxiety as to whether he would ever be able to take breasts. Those additions which he found hugely embarrassing and which distinguished Deanna Durbin from Rycroft Minor, the school tart, who was readily available for a box of chocolate biscuits. As humble privates in the Harrow Officers' Training Corps, Oliver and I were sent to Aldershot on manoeuvres organised by the Brigade of Guards. We'd chosen a peaceful spot, far away from the action where Tenton, having got hold of a box of flares, was staging his own display of pyrotechnics and setting fire to the undergrowth. I suppose we'll be really doing this in a year or two. You may be doing it. I'll have a different sort of job, I imagine. Not that I shall be able to tell you much about it. Well, that'll make a change. I suppose you mean you'll be in the Secret Service because of the languages they know you speak. And because of the languages they don't know I speak. My Ma's leaving the Dorchester. Oliver surprisingly volunteered some information. She's going to America. It's the end of civilization as we know it. Chap in the government told her that. Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, came down to visit us. He can't have been more than 65 years old, but his ancient head emerged from the carapace of his dinner jacket like the hairless pate of a tortoise. His old hand trembled on the handle of the walking stick which supported him, and his voice, when he spoke, was heavily slurred with brandy and old age. He seemed to us to be about 103. If they ever put him in charge of the war, I whispered to Oliver, God help us all. Oh, they won't do that, he assured me. They'll never do that. Chap in the government told my ma. writer, my father said after I'd told him that I'd sold my first short story to the Horovian for ten bob. My dear boy, have some sort of consideration for your unfortunate wife. You'll be sitting around the house all day, wearing a dressing gown, brewing tea and stumped for words. You'll be far better off in the law. That's the great thing about the law. It gets you out of the house. The war, which had removed most of the young barristers, had done wonders for my father's practice. He rose most days in court, fixed witnesses with his clear, blue, sightless eyes, and lured them into confessions of adultery, cruelty, or willful refusal to consummate their marriages. As soon as he could, he caught the train back from London to the wonders of his garden. I don't know if I can describe it or whether it has become, during the years I have lived here, over-familiar, like faces you see every day. In his twenty acres of chalky fields, there were two inexplicable dells, great holes in the ground, 
which long ago may have been burial places or gravel pits, and are now filled with beech trees. Near to them my father built a small thirties house with white walls and green tiles, a building in the sort of Spanish musical comedy tradition handed down through the garages on the Great West Road which pleased the architect he employed. It still has light fittings which might have come from the Savoy Hotel. Away from the house he planned huge herbaceous borders to stretch away to a field of magnolias and rarer ornamental trees. In the spring, the copses are full of daffodils and narcissi. Tall, pale green and white Japanese flowering cherries, which he planted, tremble in the twilight like enormous ghosts. He planned the large kitchen garden, with fruit cages in which loganberries and white raspberries, gooseberries and melons and strawberries grew, usually in the company of some panic-stricken and imprisoned bird. It's a great feeding place for marauders from the beech woods. Pheasants, jays and pigeons ravish the vegetables. At night there's a great noise of owls, and in my father's day we often used to see glowworms, although they seem rarer now. The times I most clearly remember with my father were the long walks we took together, when I would guide him through the dark, insect-buzzing woods, steering him past the tentacles of bramble, keeping her away from branches where the gamekeepers had gibbeted magpies and squirrels as a warning to others. We used to sit by the fire at night, he in the wing chair I still use, and I read him what I had begun to write, a novel about Henley, the town below us in the valley, the brewery and the regatta. Sometimes he would laugh at the jokes. Sometimes he said, sorry stuff or rather poor fooling, and I knew furiously that he was right. I think we might run to Oxford, my father had said, provided you fall in and read the law. I still felt my time was likely to be short, and my future, as the news of the war grew more depressing, uncertain. Meanwhile, I fell in, and I read law with no real faith in ever surviving to practice it. Again I wondered about my father's choice. Why Oxford? He'd been at Cambridge, and Brasenose was a college he'd only heard mentioned in an apparently disparaging way by someone in his chambers many years before. But as he offered me Oxford, like the sausages and scrambled eggs of the condemned man's breakfast, I felt it would be churlish to refuse. Oxford was at the end of an era and I was at the end of my extraordinary middle-class thirties education. The Oxford of the twenties and thirties was still there, like college claret, but it was rationed on coupons, and there was not very much of it left. The famous characters still behaved as though they lingered in the pages of Decline and Fall. They were famous for being nothing except Oxford characters. Once they left their natural habitat in Magdalen or the house, they grew faint and dim, and ended up down back corridors in Bush House or as announcers on Radio Monte Carlo. They had double-barreled names like Edward Faith Peterson and Tommy Mott Smith. By day, they lay naked in their rooms, listening to Puccini or the Verdi Requiem. By night, they would issue into the blackout, camel hair coats slung across their shoulders, bow ties from Hall Brothers settled under their lightly powdered chins to take the exotic dinner, maximum spending allowed under the Ministry of Food Regulations 5 Bob, at the smartest restaurants. What did it matter if the omelette were of dried egg, or the drink rationed Algerian, or even black market communion wine topped up with spirits, gin and altars? They still talked about Furbank and Beardsley and how, sometime in the long vacation, They'd met Brian Howard, supposed model for an Evelyn War character, itching in his A.C. Plonk's uniform in the downstairs bar at the Ritz. So, at Oxford, after Dunkirk, the fashion was to be homosexual. It seems it was only after the war, with the return of the military, that heterosexuality came to be completely tolerated. As it was, my sporadic adventures with wafts and girls from St Hilda's my grandly titled engagement to a student of book illustration at the Slade were subjects I preferred not to discuss with 
Tommy Mott Smith when he invited me and my friend Oliver for a five-shilling blowout at the George. The high life of Oxford was something I never encountered when I first moved into my room in Meadow Buildings. To my dismay, I found I was sharing them with Parsons, a tall man with bicycle clips and a pronounced Adam's apple who tried to lure me into the Bible Society. One night, Oliver and I boiled up Algerian wine, college sherry, and a bottle of Bols he'd stolen from his mother's flat in Parson's electric kettle. When I recovered from the draught, I found Parson's wearing cycle clips and kneeling over me in prayer. I also heard, coming from down the corridor, the sound of Brahms' Fourth Symphony, like music from some remote paradise. In fact, my memory of Oxford seems, looking back over a vast distance, to consist almost entirely of Brahms' Fourth Symphony, a piece of music of which I have become decreasingly fond, as I have lost the taste for bow ties, Balkan Sobrani cigarettes and sherry and balls boiled up in an electric kettle. But that music came from someone who did affect my view of the world and of whom I still think with gratitude and bewilderment when I remember his serene life and extraordinary death. My father, to whom I owe so much, never told me the difference between right and wrong, and now I think that's why I remain so greatly in his debt. But Henry Winter, who slowly and with enormous care sharpened a thorn needle to play Brahms on his huge gramophone, became a kind of yardstick, not of taste but of moral behaviour. He had no doubts whatever about the war. He knew that killing people was wrong. He looked forward with amused calm to the call-up, the refusal to put on uniform, the arguments before the tribunals, and the final consignment to Pentonville or the fire service. He read classics, and read them in the way I read Isherwood or Julian Green. He would sit in a squeaking basket chair, smoking a pipe, and giving me his version of chunks of Homer and Euripides, which up to then I had been trained to regard as almost insoluble crossword puzzles or grammarian's equations with no recognisable human content. I was born of tone-deaf parents and in the school songs have been instructed to open my mouth soundlessly so that no emergent discord might mar the occasion. Yet Winter slowly, painstakingly introduced me to music and the pleasure I take in it now is due entirely to him. I suppose Oxford's greatest gift is friendship, for which there's all the time in the world. After Oxford there are love affairs, marriages, working relationships, manipulations, lifelong enemies, but even then in rationed, blacked-out Oxford there were limitless hours for talking, drinking, staying up all night, going for walks with a friend. Oliver Pensotti left to become, thanks to his knowledge of languages, a subaltern in the intelligence corps. He bought a sickly-looking poison ring from an antique shop in Broad Street and wore it with his uniform, dark glasses and scuffed suede shoes. He looked less like a spy catcher than some minor member of an unsuccessful South American military junta. Henry Winter's sincerity was obvious to the tribunal which tried his case and he was sent to a pacifist service unit near Paddington Station. There he helped to dig bodies out of the rubble after air raids and carry the injured to hospital. Jack Beddington, son of a barrister my father knew and a neighbour in the country, was in charge of propaganda films at the Ministry of Information. Mr Beddington, many years before, had seen me do a Punch and Judy show in my puppet theatre and took the view the performance showed just the talent needed to wage the war against fascism. He offered me a job for when I came down from Oxford. I got a war degree. It was given with no ceremony and luckily for me there were no classes. It was just one more utility BA. So I left Oxford Station for the last time and went up the line to London, scene of all excitement to the Blitz and to the Swiss pub and the Coffee Ann, to the bookshops in the Charing Cross Road and to the Ministry of Information 
with the girls with pillar box red lipstick and padded shoulders and Betty Grable curls and silver barrage balloons floating over gutted terraces in a blue sky and to Winter's pacifist service unit in Paddington. The pacifists used to take turns in cooking and the quality of the stew when I went to visit Winter depended on the various talents of the pacifists on the rota. However bad the cooking, there were always bitter arguments about the size of the helpings, on which subject the conscientious objectors, before my astonished eyes, almost came to blows. Only winter remained imperturbably calm. After dinner was over and washed up, he would fill his pipe and play the Brahms forth and tell me that he had seen so much of man's mayhem in the Blitz that he had decided to qualify as a doctor after the war. Although his education had been entirely classical, and his decision would mean his starting again with elementary science, he was prepared to work as a hospital porter and put in the necessary five or six years study. He also told me that he'd fallen in love with the red-haired girlfriend of the leader of another pacifist service unit. Her name was Lillian, and one night after supper, and a movement of the Brahms, we went to visit her in a bed sitting room in a tall grey house left standing like a solitary tooth in the decayed mouth of a crescent behind Westbourne Grove. Lillian was strikingly handsome, but whilst we were talking to her quite innocently, she heard her lover come up the stairs, and she told us to go out and hide on the fire escape, as his visit would only be a short one, and we did so. A small, stocky pacifist in ARP uniform erupted into the room. He heard some stirring behind the blackout curtains, immediately opened the wardrobe, pulled out an army rifle, and loading it in a practice sort of way, advanced on our hiding place at the top of the fire escape. When he saw us, he accused us both of the gravest misconduct with Lillian and offered to wing us both in a sensitive area. Winter took the pipe out of his mouth and smiled reasonably. You can't possibly do that, he said. You're the head man of a pacifist service unit. You totally rule out the use of force. Isn't that what you told your tribunal? I saw no future in a political argument about violence in public and private situations. I could see that the collapse of Western civilization might seem of lesser importance to the irate pacifist than the suspected gangbang of Lillian. I dragged Winter away down the iron stairway and didn't stop running until we had got to a safe bar in Notting Hill Gate. the film bug bites you, said the head of the Crown Film Unit, a man called Ian Dalrymple, who smoked cigarettes through a white paper holder, you never recover. In the days when I bumped the producer's car short-sightedly into the petrol pumps, or lost 50 electricians on a train journey to Liverpool, or when the camera crew set fire to their table in the Adelphi Hotel by lighting cigarettes with strips of film, I thought that if enthusiasm for films was a disease, it was probably curable, at least as far as I was concerned. I didn't know how right, in fact, Ian Dalrymple was. Most of the films we made were conspicuously lacking in human interest. Their great concern was with machines, usually bombers, or other engines of death, which were shown rising slowly into the air to the music of Dr. Vaughan Williams. Human beings were treated with less respect. They never said much to each other except, Roger and out, or what about a brew up, George, or Jerry's a bit naughty tonight. They sat stolidly on tractors or watched the return of the herring fleet with dogged patience, or if women toiled at the assembly line, 
with their hair tied up in scarves. I don't remember any of our films in which the characters complained about the war or tried to fiddle extra expenses on the fire watching or had love affairs with the wives of soldiers posted to the western desert although these seem to be the chief occupations of the carpenters, plasterers and electricians with whom I spent my time. For a great deal of it we played pontoon in a disused prop room among the thrones and four posters of Corder's pre-war film empire, totally unaccompanied by the music of Dr. Vaughan Williams. Seen the King last night, John? Charlie, the prop man, used to call out as he spotted me lurking in a corner of the set, trying to avoid the camera or the all-seeing eye of Doris, the lady producer with the fur coat slung over her shoulders, khaki trousers and short cheroot, who might, if she spotted me, bark an order to fetch her car or the director's vitamin pills. At first I didn't know whether Charlie's daily question was based on a misconception of my social status. Did he think old Herovians were in daily contact with royalty? And then he would repeat the formula more slowly, making the words clearer. Add it in last night, John. I tried an enigmatic smile. Didn't spend out on her, I hope. Charlie was as anxious as I was about my financial situation. No, I, I didn't spend out on her. Never invest a penny piece till she's given you one. That's the rule, boy. Then you can run to half a mild and bitter between the two of you. It was a new approach to courtship. At Oxford, I'd bought books on credit and sold them immediately second-hand to take home students out to dinner at the Mitre with nothing at all to show for it. I was in a new world from which, in my one-class, one-sex schools, and the isolation of my father's house and garden, I had long been segregated. It was a world full of sauce sandwiches and fiddle petty cash vouchers, and playing solo with the hourly boys and tea breaks, and union get-togethers when the sense of the meeting was put by brother chair, and girls who were known generically as smigget, and where the expression, having your greens, no longer meant finishing up the cabbage and making a clean plate. There were days which began in the cold light of dawn in a mocked-up gun emplacement and ended in the public bar of the crooked billeted Ivor Heath singing Roll Out the Barrel or in an Uxbridge cinema watching Alice Fay or Carmen Miranda. There were times when I first experienced the only sort of group loyalty I've ever been able to manage to a collection of people tirelessly engaged on one piece of work, producing a film, or a play, or a television programme, or perhaps later, defending a man accused of murder. With Venus entering your birth sign, this is a good week for you to make up a long-standing dispute with a partner. Jill, the continuity girl, used to read the horoscope from her woman's own, and I kept up the pretense of having a partner a bit of smigget next door, perhaps, or a little woman in St. John's Wood. Jill also taught me many of the mysteries of the film business. When shooting in a street, she used to put down five shillings on the expense sheet to buying a penny whistle, because there was a mythical child near all locations who wouldn't stop ruining the sound by playing this instrument until it was bought up at an exorbitant price. From time to time, a sweet, melancholy music could be heard in the corridors of the Crown Film Unit. It was the poet Laurie Lee playing on his recorder. Laurie Lee used to lean against the wall, bronzed from his walks across Spain, his long sojourns in Gloucestershire, looking like a small, sly pan, piping endlessly, and the secretaries would open their doors and hope to speak to him. He was the official scriptwriter of Crown, not that he could be blamed for the dialogue of our more pedestrian films, which was usually cobbled together by the director with the help of the amateur actors and a few ideas thrown in by Doris after an evening in the pub. You see, Laurie isn't really very keen on this war. He was more interested in the war in Spain. One of the secretaries, whose name was Mavis, told me this. She was a hugely desirable girl with a face the colour of brown farmhouse eggs and her eyes were like their hard-boiled whites with dark centres. I invited her home and broke all Charlie's rules by treating her in all the pubs in the neighbourhood, and I filled her handkerchief with glowworms 
when I walked her home across the common, but she did nothing but talk about Laurie Lee. After the weekend, Charlie asked me if I'd seen the king, and I replied with a silence I hope he might take for an embarrassed confession. After what seemed a lifetime as an assistant director, I was called into the office of the new head of the Crown Film Unit, an extremely kind man who looked at me sadly. We were wondering, he said gently, whether you were exactly cut out by nature to be an assistant director. I mean, Doris says you're having a bit of trouble saying quiet, please. Well, just a bit, I had to admit it. A bit of trouble, Doris tells me, getting the electricians to Liverpool. Well, I did find them in the end. Look, you are a writer, aren't you? I'd had one story published in the Herovian and one in Lilliput. I secretly cherished half a novel about the Crown Film Note, which I was writing between takes. Oh, yes, I said. I'm a writer. There's going to be a vacancy in the script department when Laurie goes. The idea we've arrived at, that is, uh, <coughs> Doris and I have arrived at it, is that we should all be a great deal better off with you in the script department. Script writers have almost never been known to lose the electricians. Look, we'll send you off somewhere to write a script, and then you can show it to Laurie, and if he passes it, you're on. I went to the door in a sort of dream. My first novel may have been unpublishable, but now I was a writer. My pay packet would say so, just as my battle dress shoulder flash said, Crown Film Unit. Only when I got to the door did a doubt cross my mind. Where will you send me off to write a script, I mean? If the head of the unit was laughing to himself, he had the mercy not to show it. Well, I don't know, he said. What about Watford Junction? I went to Watford on a bicycle and spent a day staring at the railway lines and the rolling stock without inspiration. Then I went home and wrote a script based on the movies I had admired, La Femme du Boulanger, La Bête Humaine, about a station master's wife and her unhappy love affair with a G.I. in charge of an American army transport post. I sat by the fire after dinner and read it aloud to my father, doing the characters in various voices. When the war's over, old boy, he said when I'd finished, I think you ought to take the bar exams. I think that would be a wise precaution. Jill typed out my script very neatly, and I gave it to Laurie Lee, who vanished with it. I didn't see him again for a number of years. However, he must have given it his seal of approval, or my quiet pleas must have deteriorated even further, because a month later I was posted as an official writer with a salary which rose to the almost unthinkable height of eleven pounds a week. The time had come to say goodbye to Slough. I moved to London. Time, like short sight, improves every view, but there is no doubt that London, a place I now inhabit only under compulsion, was a better city then. There were no tower blocks, Soho was full of food shops and Italian restaurants, and only a very occasional and apologetic grimy window displaying durex, trusses and a volume of craft ebbing hinted gently at the distant coming of the pornorama and the boutique of sexual aids. It seemed a perpetual adventure to buy second-hand books in the Charing Cross Road, or drink in the Swiss pub or the York Minster, or stand outside Gould Street Underground Station in that long silence filled with infinite possibilities between the moment when the buzz bombs cut off and the thud as they fell somewhere else. So I lived in London and went on journeys in blacked out trains to factories and coal mines and military and air force installations. For the first and in fact the only time in my life I was, thanks to Laurie Lee, earning my living entirely as a writer. If I have knocked the documentary ideal, I wouldn't wish to sound ungrateful to the Crown Film Unit. I was given great and welcome opportunities to write dialogue, construct scenes, and try and turn ideas into some kind of visual drama. I had the pretext, which the law has also given me, for talking to an endless variety of people and asking them impertinent questions. But my aims and interests were far from the documentary ideal. Drama to me meant the lines of Shakespeare that my father recited with relish, the nervous elaboration and distinctive music of Gielgud's Hamlet, Laurence Olivier rolling down a flight of stairs as dead Coriolanus, 
Donald Wolfett bringing tears to my eyes as Lear in Lunchtime Shakespeare played in front of tabs with minimal support. With my head full of such miracles, I found it hard to reconcile myself to lines which always had to be played with a stiff upper lip, like Roger and Out. One day, at Pinewood Studios, I saw something other than the usual crowd of chippies, prop men, directors, electricians, and members of the Army and Air Force film units. There were not only the Bolting brothers in khaki, and Richard Attenborough and Jack Clayton strangely dressed in Air Force blue, and even Garson Kane in an American officer's uniform, but a number of visitors who looked even more remarkable. The canteen was full of nuns. As I queued up behind one particularly devout-looking sister for my plate of beans and bacon, she turned round and whispered through a delicate Cupid's bow of a mouth, it's being a virgin, dear, that makes you so bloody hungry. The war, of course, had ended, and Pinewood, after its flirtation with the facts, was returning to the honest pursuit of fiction. The nuns were extras in the film of a rummer gotten novel called The Black Narcissus. Elsewhere, the piping times of peace were being ushered in by movies of sensational happenings during the Regency, usually starring Margaret Lockwood armed with a hunting crop and James Mace. The safe war years, when most of the decisions had been made for us, were over. It was time to think of the future. The Crown Film Unit had a new director, whose name was Alexander Shaw, and he looked like the nicer type of Roman emperor. I thought you might like to go up to Glasgow, he said. Write a script about a new attitude to town planning. Oh, no, thanks, I said. I don't think I will. It's an important subject for peacetime. I think I'd better go away, I told him, and be a barrister. That's what I was always meant for. Don't tell me Alexander Shaw looked genuinely concerned that you haven't been happy here. Oh, yes, I said. I've been very happy, but not any more. You're back, my father said. That's good. You can give me a hand killing the earwig. happens, I asked my father as I started in the divorce business, if the innocent party is living with someone else, do they have to separate? No, but you must advise them to stop sleeping together until the decree absolute. For six months? Why ever not? My father seemed to find this perfectly acceptable. Well, how do you put it exactly to the client? You tell them to exercise a self-denying ordinance. So I saw my father, the doyen of the divorce bar, in a rare row, that of the confessor, imposing a few Hail Marys and a period of abstinence. This was the sort of law I was engaged in during the first years of my married life. We had gone to stay in Ireland before we were married, and Penelope had stood on the beach in Connemara, looking at the sea, tempted, as she sometimes was in those days, by thoughts of death. Our temperaments differed in that, while I looked at life a good deal of the time with facile optimism, she got her strength, and I sometimes thought her pleasure also, from the undoubted awfulness of the human situation. She contemplated an increasingly desperate plight with a gloom which was frequently expressed with humour and a kind of glee. This attitude, so painful to her that it became at times heroic, provided the source from which she was able to produce her novels and short stories. She would lie stretched out in front of the fire, filling notebooks with her neat handwriting, or sit in the sun with her typewriter clicking endlessly, whilst the growing band of small girls galloped through the unmown grass astride short sticks 
which they made believe to be horses and fed under the hedges with small plates of cornflakes. Meanwhile, I was writing out further and better particulars of intolerable conduct leading to the breakdown of the marriage, or, as time went on, preparing to fight the case of the Methodist minister whose wife ran away with the district nurse. We had a huge Victorian family house in Swiss Cottage with dark corners in the basement and unvisited rooms in the attic where children could hide, laugh and run to sulk or cry unnoticed. There was also in the Swiss Cottage area at that time a wonderful sadness which seemed, for some reason which I cannot entirely recall, well suited to our mood. There was a sort of late Viennese melancholy, promoted by the large number of middle-aged refugees who sat drinking café mit Schlag on the Finchley Road tea rooms and then returned to their bed sitters to listen to Mahler on the wireless and work out chess problems. They were the lost families who, during the war, felt particular terror when they were able to shout at an approaching aircraft, It's one of ours! On summer evenings, the crumbling terraces would come to life with the sound of exiled string quartets, rehearsing for concerts which might never be arranged. The Swiss cottage house contained the lifetime of our marriage. It was the setting for the Christmases when the children were kept waiting outside the sitting room door, breathless with expectation, and for the New Year's Eve party where a literary county court judge tried to persuade a despairing young poet not to hang himself because it would be so embarrassing for his honour to have to give evidence at the inquest. It was the place we were glad to see when we came home from holidays abroad and where, on many occasions, a strong feeling of doom was passed round the huge nursery lunches with the roast potatoes. It did us for almost twenty years and put up with the vagaries of fashion from the austere fifties to the more affluent sixties. At first we had single walls painted in distinct poster colours in the manner of the great exhibition on the South Bank. A small flourish of culture, now almost forgotten, which left a memory not of the Crystal Palace but of the Guinness clock. Then we had ivy-leaved wallpaper and rubber plants during the early Expresso Age and the Great Sanderson Revival. Finally, we installed a kitchen designed by Terence Conran with a room divider, orange cupboards and concealed lighting. By that time, the destruction of the area was almost complete. The new apartment blocks were forming up around us and the moulded ceilings had begun to tremble and crack and shower plaster down into the hall. The Terence Conran kitchen stood cheerful and functional in the centre of a disintegrating house and marriage. As the cracks spread, we evacuated the house, and in the course of time, new lives were started. We didn't expect the house to survive our departure, but unexpectedly it has and stands almost alone among a forest of North London towers, of cubbyholes, places where there is no room to put the books or for the children to hide. It's still a beleaguered witness to a Victorian ideal of family living. In order to get work at the divorce bar, our clerk told me, you had to get solicitors to like the cut of your jib. This could only be done by appearing in court, something that you wouldn't be asked to do until you'd met a few solicitors who liked the cut of your jib. This was the sort of difficulty which could last a lifetime, as with some unfortunates it did. Resolved to participate in the legal world, I started doing poor person's divorces and going to a free legal aid centre in the East End of London. Neither of these sources could be relied on to produce what my father called money briefs, but they might yield appearances in court and introductions to solicitors. So I sat in the legal aid centre in the evenings, longing for a murderer to come rushing in with a dripping knife, begging me to conduct his defence. All I got was a succession of bewildered old ladies in trouble with their pensions and their rents, ushered in by a tireless, chain-smoking, underpaid and uncomplaining administrator, who only really cheered up when she could produce a husband accused of outrageous cruelty, or a young fairground boxer faced with ten paternity summonses. He's certainly innocent, she muttered persuasively past a haze of smoke, 
He was in strict training at the time. Never an expert on rents or pensions, I was of limited use to my clients at the Free Legal Aid Centre, but they taught me never to show surprise at instructions, however unlikely. One completely credible and highly respectable lady sought a divorce, but had to admit that her son, a young post office worker whom she brought with her, was not her husband's child, although he'd been born during the marriage. It took a good many visits and some close questioning before she admitted that she had been uh, impregnated by the spirit of the late Ramsay MacDonald who came at her over the wireless waves as she was passing Bush House. In the end, I remember, she got her divorce and proved on all other subjects a most sensible and reliable witness. So, by way of the poor persons and free legal aid and by courtesy of a few undefendeds which fell from my father's table on the days when he was in a probate action or laid up with a cold or had wisely chosen to stay at home wearing his straw hat and pricking out antirrhinums, I got into court and managed in the course of time to meet that great source of money briefs, the solicitor's managing clerk. Managing clerks of the old school where it seemed to me the main prop and buttress of the legal system. When qualified solicitors were too busy conveying office blocks or attending funerals to bother with the daily grind of the High Court of Justice, their unqualified managing clerks, equipped with an old raincoat whose pockets were stuffed with writs and summonses, escorted mink-coated actresses through the divorce courts and cajoled greedy beneficiaries into accepting settlements in will cases. I remember particularly Mr Wyvern, with a plume of grey hair over a bald pate, spectacles as thick as the bottoms of beer mugs, and a head worn always tilted to one side, who would pull the essential and disgraceful facts out of a divorce case with the delicate enthusiasm of a bird extracting a juicy worm from a dry garden. There was also Mr Bertram, small and very fat, with a purple nose and a hat turned up all round, which made him look like a North Country comic, a deceptive appearance because he was both legally astute and deeply puritanical, believing that all women in divorce cases were reincarnations of La Dame aux Camellia and destined for a tragic death if they didn't reform. Mr Wyvern, Mr Bertram and others like them were the men whom I had to get to like the cut of my jib and I proceeded to woo them with a grosser flattery and more assiduous courtship than I have ever used on a lady. I drank endless cups of coffee with them in the crypt under the law courts. I paced up and down the corridor outside the summons room with them, waiting to do a spot of custody, or I travelled with them on the tube to doomed confrontations before the Uxbridge magistrates. I inquired endlessly after Mr Wyvern's tomato plants, and the health of his begonias. I asked for daily bulletins on Mr Bertram's daughter's progress in the small but cutthroat world of Croydon figure skating. When Mr Wyvern asked if I and my good lady would care to be his guests at one of his Masonic occasions, I lacked the courage to refuse immediately. So much fairex, so many knicker linings, depended, I knew, on the likability of my jib. Husbands and wives don't rush into divorce. They are put up with the most appalling home conditions rather than apply for the order of release. I discovered couples who hadn't spoken for years and who communicated solely by means of laconic and unfriendly notes left on the boiler or on the kitchen table with a plate of congealed stew. Let her down the office heat this up for you. She seems to do everything else. Or... Your conduct last night with the hall light just about beat the band. I take it you're now going all out for my financial ruin. Were common phrases in this sort of correspondence. I heard of a general who used to address letters to the furniture his wife's family provided, leaving on the articles concerned notes like, You're a very vulgar little sideboard. Go back to Whiteley's where you came from. The wonder was not that this sort of conduct led to the divorce court, but that it was tolerated for so long without complaint. This toleration is no doubt due to a reluctance to admit defeat. 
It also comes, I'm sure, from a terror of loneliness. Any human relationship, however painful and absurd, even if it's reduced to a trickle of abusive little notes in a desert of silence, can seem preferable to the uncharted waters of divorce. Better, perhaps, a life of choked-back fury and a companion to hate than the loneliness of the bed-sitter and the silence of a book in the corner of a holiday hotel. In the absurd world of the old-style divorce court, I was treating life in the law with peculiar seriousness, enjoying the hunt for briefs and to practice. I behaved more like a lawyer than I have done since, and bought a bowler hat, an umbrella, and a pair of striped trousers. Clad in these, I met my old Oxford friend, Henry Winter, for lunch in Elvino's, and allowed him the privilege of watching me do a separation order down at Tower Bridge. When we came away from the case, which I'd lost, I saw him staring at me with amusement. What are you looking at? Your barrister's set. My what? It's like those cards with bits of costume stuck on them that children used to get for Christmas. A ticket collector's set, and a nurse's set, and a Red Indian set. They just have the hat and the main essentials, like the ticket punch or the thermometer. Yours is the barrister's set. You mean, you don't think I'm really a barrister? I don't know, do you? In my struggle to provide a satisfactorily affirmative answer to Winter's question, Penelope gave me every support. She used the machine on which she had written her first novel to type my divorce petitions, tapping out paragraphs of willful refusal to consummate or desertion without cause or particulars of deep humiliation and distress, the long litany of broken homes which I had learnt at my father's knee.